Hello, Theodore Schubot here, giving you guys another message that you will not hear at church. I guarantee that thousands of Westerners, uh, specifically Americans and Europeans, are joining Christian militants in Iraq. Christian uh, militias, they are going in there to fight with the Christian militants against ISIS. Play the clip. Thousands of foreigners have flocked to Iraq and Syria, most of them, to join Islamic State, but there are few who came to fight on the other side by joining a small Christian militia. Dweik Nosha operates alongside Kurdish Peshmerga forces to protect a cluster of Christian villages on the front line. 28-year-old Brett is one of the volunteers who came from overseas, a U.S. Army veteran who recently returned to Iraq to fight Islamic State in what he sees as a wider war between good and evil. We want to ensure the security here. I mean, it's, it's great people and we want to be able to, the towns that we're in control of right now, uh, they have the ability to live a, a pretty undisturbed life. I mean, the nerves are on end, but they can go to work. Uh, you know, they can live a decent life and still have security knowing we're here to protect them. The church bells ring and, you know, that's what we want to do is we want to ensure that the church bells continue to ring and uh, we're working on getting some of the talents out of Daesh's hands. Brett is the only one of the foreign volunteers to have engaged in fighting so far. The others only recently arrived and were turned back from the front line on Friday by Kurdish security services because they did not have necessary approval from the authorities. I'm here in uh, Kurdistan to help uh, all of the people that are being sold into slavery, children being killed, uh, Christians being displaced, and uh, basically to protect anyone who needs help, regardless of their religion, okay? Uh, I'm from North Carolina, United States, and I'm more than happy to be here. What do you want to accomplish? What I want to accomplish is to uh, get Dash out of this country, destroy them, basically. Their motives for doing so differ, but they share a belief that the Islamic State is a threat. I'm not too worried about the, um, the Daesh, what they can do to me, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm one man, but I'm, I'm here to protect the innocent at all costs, at all costs. Oh, yeah. and uh, it's, out of, it's out of love, you know, and concern and respect for these people here. And I'd like to see all the communities uh, working together, you know, people from every race and uh, religious background to defeat ISIS which is really a menace, not only in this part of the world, but as you know, they're threatening people in Europe and North America. It's a world problem and we all need to get involved. Now, after watching that, there's several observations that I want to make about these Westerners who are going in to join the ranks of uh, Christian militants to fight uh, ISIS. Uh, for one, notice what one of the fighters say. He says, we are going in there because we want to fight against evil, we want to fight against ISIS, but then he, he says, it's out of love. This is one of the greatest modern illustrations that I've seen in our own time of someone, a greatest modern illustration of someone truly explaining the Christian view of love. And so when I, you know, I, and I see the misconception of love, I see the misconstruing of the Christian position on love uh, every single day on the internet. You know, any any time I go against homosexuality or, or Muslims or Islam or whatever, I always have to hear, you have no love. Jesus told us to love. God is love. Jesus would never talk like that. Jesus would never do that. And it's really, uh, it's, it's a horrible, disorderly, misconstruing of what love truly is. And um, one story that I like to point out to people when I'm explaining uh, the Christian viewpoint of love is the story of Moses defending the daughters of Jethro against the uh, the capricious or the, um, the very greedy shepherds, very violent shepherds. And the shepherds are always coming in, harassing Jethro's daughters. And every time they come to bring water from the well, there are, the, there are these shepherds there to harass them and beat them around and eventually just drive them out of the wells. And Moses comes along, and here he is. The shepherds aren't attacking him. 
the shepherds aren't doing anything bad to him. Moses was probably a big guy. He was probably a very intimidating guy. He killed that Egyptian who was beating up that uh, that Hebrew. And he was, I mean, they must have looked at him and said, eh, we, don't, we really don't want to mess with this guy. We don't want to screw around with him. So they didn't mess with him. There was no danger towards Moses' life. But there was a danger toward others' others' lives. And so Moses acts out of love by defending someone not for his own gain, not for his own self-protection, but for the protection of Jethro's daughters. And of course, Jethro sees that virtue in Moses and says, hey, you're worthy to marry one of my daughters. And that's one of the stories I love to point to people and say, this is the authentic, or this is a, an authentic illustration of what love truly is. And another great verse to go to, go to is, of course, in um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, where Paul says the purpose of the commandment is love, meaning the purpose of the law is love. Then you go to Romans 13, where it says, uh, Paul says, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery. And whatever other commandment is written, it is written uh, in the law of love. It is written in, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as you love thyself. So all of the law can be summarized as the law of love. And that includes the destruction of evildoers. That includes the punishment of evildoers. That includes the protection of innocent lives by fighting against wicked and evil people. And so when the Crusaders rose up, rose up in, the, in the Middle Ages, uh, they rose up out of love to defend their brethren. And that's how I see these, these warriors here. Now I'm going to talk about these men here. For one, they are extraordinary people. They are extra, by extraordinary, I mean that in the fullest sense of the word. They are extraordinary in their virtue. Um, there are very few people out there like him, like this. There are very few people out there. And these men, they're, they're true Christians. Uh, just looking at them, just lack of better words, these are true Christians. These are men who have gone out of their way, not for women, not for attention, not for fame, none of that. They're going in there strictly to... Um, to save Christian lives, and as the first gentleman said, we are here to make sure that the church bells keep ringing, and that means we are here to per to make sure that Christianity, the Christian faith, is going to perpetuate in Iraq without the hindrance and the impending of the wicked and insidious devils of ISIS. There's one. There's another observation that I want to make. The first man who was interviewed in this video, his name is Brett. He's 28 years old. I found out more about this man in a great article that was written today on El Arabiya. And it says here, St. Michael, the archangel of battle, is tattooed across the back of Brett. So Brett, Brett has a tattoo of St. Michael, the archangel, on him. And, uh, it, and then it's this is very interesting. It says, um, Brett carries the same thumb-worn Bible, a pocket Bible he did while was deployed to Iraq in 2006, a picture of the Virgin Mary tucked inside its pages and his favorite verses highlighted. Now this is very interesting because Brett uh, has a very uh, profound insight in the Holy Scripture. He's going in there into battle. He's going there to kill people. He's going in there to kill evil people to protect Christians and yet here he is bringing in the Bible. Now, in my perspective, in my medievalist perspective, uh, I see that and I see that as completely adequate. Completely adequate. It fits. The Bible fits perfectly in a situation such as fighting evildoers. Because in the end of the day, that's what Christianity is about. It's about fighting evildoers. It's about carrying the cross of Christ and fighting Satan. And that fight against Satan can consist of numerous situations. And but in every situation, be it in exorcisms, be it in charity, be it in helping uh, people who are in, in deep trouble, you know, char in charitable work, uh, helping persecuted Christians as we are doing, um, help or, or, or in joining a militia, picking up a gun and, 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 and killing a Muslim terrorist, all of these situations consist of the same objective, and that objective is victory in battle against the devil. And that spiritual battle, of course, is always going to be used through physical means. And when Christ was on the cross, he was in battle with the devil, and he was doing it through physical means. The cross was physical, the nails were physical, the lance was physical, all these things were physical. And so, Brett has Michael the Archangel on his back, but then, here's the thing that I want to focus on. He has a picture of the Virgin Mary tucked inside his, his Bible. Now, many people will say, well, the Virgin Mary is a woman. 
she gave birth to Jesus Christ, that's great and all, but what does she have to do with battle? And when you read the Magnificat, and I'm just going to to read it to you guys, and the Magnificat is the famous prayer of Mary, the prayer that she made after the angel Gabriel foretold to her that she was going to give birth to Jesus Christ. And the Magnificat is in chapter 1 of the Gospel of Luke, beginning with verse 46. And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaid. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. When was the last time you called Mary blessed? For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats, and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath, seat empty, he hath sent empty away. He hath hope in his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. For he spake to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. Now notice what she says here in verse 52 of Luke 1. Now, actually, no, in verse 51 of, of Luke 1, she says, He hath showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. So she, here is Mary describing God as a warrior, defeating his enemies, defeating the proud. And then she says, He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. So he, here is Mary explaining the nature of God. Here is God as warrior and God as merciful. And so she is explaining the nature of God, and it is this nature of God that we take within ourselves. We have to be, as God, merciful, ferocious against the wicked, but charitable and merciful at the same time when it is necessary and when, when it needs to be done. And so here is Mary explaining the, war, the warrior nature of God. And so Mary, having this profound knowledge of the warrior nature of God, she conceives God. I mean, she doesn't give birth to God, like the eternal God. She doesn't give birth to the Holy Trinity. But she gives birth to the humanity of God. God the Son. Don't be confused me with those, with those one as Pentecostalers. She gives birth to God the Son in the flesh. So she, her womb provides the humanity of God. And so she has the greatest relationship ever with God because she has God physically within her womb. And so she, of course, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, being inspired by the Holy Trinity, would have come to a great understanding of the warrior nature of God. That's the first explanation that I would give in explaining Mary's involvement, Mary's connection to holy war. And when you the next observation that I want to make is Mary's in in regards to Mary's participation in holy war is the historical viewpoint the historical perspective of Mary's involvement in holy war just to give you guys some examples when Hernando Cortez was fighting against the Indians they said that there were visions and Cortez said he saw this and numerous other conquistadors said that they saw this and even Indians said that they saw this a woman on a horse fighting against the Indians and the Indians run away this happened in, in one very fam famous battle, as is recorded by uh, Diaz, and as is recorded by Gomara, who was a secretary of Fernando Cortez. And Cortez and the other conquistadors concluded that this was the Virgin Mary fighting on their side. Another example, when the Byzantine Empire, around, I want to say, maybe the 9th century or so, or maybe in the early, early 11th century, around that time period, in the Middle Ages, um, when the Byzantine Empire was going into Sicily to retake Sicily from the Muslims, um, they built a giant church. The first thing that they did when they entered the island of Sicily was they built a giant church in dedication to the Virgin Mary. After they built the church, they defeated the Arabs, threw the Muslims out, and brought Sicily back into the fold of Christendom. 
And of course, they attributed this victory to God and the Holy Virgin Mary. Another, uh, another very profound example is the Battle of Kolikovo. And when the uh, Russians defeated the Muslim Mongolians in the, the year 1380, September 8, 1380, they attributed the victory to the Holy Virgin Mary and to God and to the Holy Trinity and to the angels that were with them. In fact, during the battle, the Muslims were winning. They were winning uh, tremendously in the beginning. And then all of a sudden, um, the miracle happened. And they said that they saw St. Demetrios and a number of other angels and saints in the battle. So they attributed it to the saints of heaven. And of course, they attributed that to the Holy Virgin Mary. And so, just read any book on Byzantine warfare or um, read any ancient book. I would recommend reading John Skylitzes or Peseos or Anacomnenos. Read any of these books and you will see what I'm saying is correct. And even when the emperors would go into war, be it with pagans or Muslims or others, they would always bring a giant icon of the Holy Virgin Mary with them, knowing and believing that she watches over them in battle. And there was even one Spanish writer, uh, I believe he was a Spanish knight, who fought in the, in the Reconquista, and he said that the Virgin Mary is always there to watch over knights. So the Virgin Mary's involvement is very, very involved um, in warfare. And anyone who reads, the middle, who reads any sort of medieval history or, or reads anything about medieval warfare will know this. And so here are these Christians... Our good friend Brett over here, who is Catholic, and as you look at his uh, look at the interview, you'll notice the rosary around his neck, and there he has a photo of the Virgin Mary. And so, if you were to ask him, "What's the Virgin Mary there for?" he would tell you, "Well, the Virgin Mary looks after me, and she intercedes for me, and she prays for me." And people would want a more profound explanation, or people, people not a profound, I shouldn't say that, but people would want a further expatiation on that. And I think I've given you a pretty, a pretty clear-cut answer, pretty clear-cut explanation as to why, um, in, in Catholic, uh, amongst Catholics and amongst Eastern Orthodox uh, Christians, they see Mary involved in the, in warfare. Well, I hope you guys have learned something from this message. I hope you guys have enjoyed this message. You just heard some theo, logic. God bless and God be with us.